Guy Fawkes was born in 1570 in Stonegate, York. He was the second of four children born to Edward Fawkes. Guy was an uncommon name in England, but may have been popular in York on account of a local notable, Sir Guy Fairfax of Steeden. The date of Falk's birth is unknown, but he was baptized in the church of St. Michael le Belfre on the 16th of April. As the customary gap between birth and baptism was three days, he was probably born on the 13th of April. In 1579, when Guy was eight years old, his father died. His mother remarried several years later. Fox may have become a Catholic around this time. After leaving school, Fox entered the service of Anthony Brown, 1st Viscount Montego. The Viscount took a dislike to Fox and after a short time dismissed him. He was subsequently employed by Anthony Maria Brown, the 2nd Viscount of Montego, who succeeded his grandfather at the age of 18. At least one source claims that Fox married and had a son, but no known contemporary accounts can confirm this. In October of 1591, Fawkes sold the estate in Clifton that he had inherited from his father. He then traveled to the continent to fight in the Eighty Years' War for Catholic Spain against the new Dutch Republic and France. Although England was not by then engaged in land operations against Spain, the two countries were still at war, and the Spanish Armada of 1588 was only five years in the past. Guy joined Sir William Stanley, an English Catholic and veteran commander, in his mid-50s, who had raised an army in Ireland. Stanley had been held in high regard by Elizabeth I, but following his surrender of Devontar to the Spanish in 1587, he and most of his troops had switched sides to serve Spain. Fox then became a junior officer, fought well at the Siege of Calais in 1596, and by 1603 had been recommended for captaincy. That year, he traveled to Spain to seek support for a Catholic rebellion in England. He used the occasion to adopt the Italian version of his name, Guido. Although he was received politely, the court of Philip III was unwilling to offer him any support. He later met Thomas Wintour, with whom he returned to England. Wintour introduced Fox to Robert Catsby. In 1604, Fox became involved with a small group of English Catholics led by Robert Catsby, who planned to assassinate the Protestant King James and replace him with his daughter, third in line of the succession, Princess Elizabeth. The first meeting of the five central conspirators took place on the 20th of May, 1604, at an inn called the Duck and Drake in the fashionable Strand District of London. Catsby had already proposed at an earlier meeting with Thomas Wintour and John Wright to kill the king and his government by blowing up the Parliament House with gunpowder. Wintour, who at first objected to the plan, was convinced by Catsby to travel to the continent to seek help. Wintour met with the Constable of Castile, the exiled Welsh spy Hugh Owen, and Sir William Stanley, who said that Catsby would receive no support from Spain. One of the conspirators, Thomas Percy, was promoted in June 1604, gaining access to a house in London that belonged to John Wynard, keeper of the king's wardrobe. Fox was installed as a caretaker and began using the pseudonym John Johnson, servant to Percy. The plotters leased an undercroft beneath the House of Lords, and Fox was placed in charge of the gunpowder they stocked there. According to Fox, 20 barrels of gunpowder were brought in at first, followed by 16 more on the 20th of July. On the 28th of that month, however, the ever-present threat of the plague delayed the opening of Parliament until Tuesday, the 5th of November. A few of the conspirators were concerned about fellow Catholics who would be present at Parliament during the opening. On the evening of the 26th of October, Lord Monteagle received an anonymous letter warning him to stay away. Despite becoming aware of the letter, the conspirators resolved to continue with their plans. Fox checked the undercroft on the 30th of October and reported that nothing had been disturbed. Montego's suspicions had been aroused, however, and the letter was shown to King James. The king ordered Sir Thomas Kinvit to conduct a search of the cellars underneath Parliament, which he did in the early hours of the 5th of November. Fox had taken up his station late on the previous night, armed with a slow match and a watch given to him by Percy, because he should know how the time went away. He was found leaving the cellar shortly after midnight and arrested. Inside, the barrels of gunpowder were discovered hidden under piles of firewood and coal. Fox gave his name as John Johnson and was first interrogated by members of the king's privy chamber, where he remained defiant. When asked by one of the lords what he was doing in possession of so much gunpowder, Fox answered that his intention was to blow you Scotch beggars back to your native mountains. Wounds on his body noted by his questionnaires, he explained as effects of pleurisy. Fox admitted his intention to blow up the House of Lords and expressed regret at his failure to do so. 
His steadfast manner earned him the admiration of King James, who described Fawkes as possessing a Roman resolution. James's admiration did not, however, prevent him from ordering on the 6th of November that John Johnson be tortured to reveal the names of his co-conspirators. He directed that the torture be light at first, referring to the use of manacles, but more severe, if necessary, authorizing the use of the rack. Fawkes was transferred to the Tower of London. The room in which Fawkes was interrogated subsequently became known as the Guy Fawkes Room. Sir William Wadd, Lieutenant of the Tower, supervised the torture and obtained Fawkes' confession. He searched his prisoner and found the letter addressed to Guy Fawkes. To Wadd's surprise, Johnson remained silent, revealing nothing about the plot or its authors. On the night of November 6th, he spoke with Wadd, who reported to Salisbury, he told us that since he undertook his action, he did every day pray to God he might perform that which might be for the advancement of the Catholic faith and saving his own soul. His composure was broken at some point during the following day, though. The observer Sir Edward Hobby remarked, Since Johnson's being in the tower, he beginneth to speak English. Fox revealed his true identity on the 7th of November and told his interrogators that there were five people involved in the plot to kill the king. He began to reveal their names on the 8th of November and told how they intended to place Prince Elizabeth on the throne. His third confession on the 9th of November implicated Francis Tresham. The trials of the eight plotters began on Monday, the 27th of January in 1606. Fox shared the barge from the Tower of London to Westminster Hall with seven of his co-conspirators. They were kept in the Star Chamber before being taken to Westminster Hall, where they were displayed on a purpose-built scaffold. The king and his close family, watching in secret, were among the spectators as the Lord's Commissioners read out the list of charges. Fox was identified then as Guido Fox, otherwise called Guido Johnson. He pleaded not guilty, despite his apparent acceptance of guilt from the moment he was captured. The jury found all the defendants guilty, and the Lord Chief Justice Sir John Popham proclaimed them guilty of high treason. The Attorney General Sir Edward Coke told the court that each of the condemned would be drawn backwards to his death by a horse, his head near the ground. They were to be put to death halfway between heaven and the earth as unworthy of both. Their genitals would be cut off and burnt before their eyes, and their bowels and hearts removed. They would then be decapitated and the dismembered parts of their bodies displayed so that they might become prayer for the fowls of the air. Fox and Tresham's testimonies regarding the Spanish treason were read out loud, as well as confessions related specifically to the gunpowder plot. The last piece of evidence offered was a confession between Fox and Wintour, who had been kept in adjacent cells. The two men apparently thought they were speaking in private, but their conversation was intercepted by a government spy. When the prisoners were allowed to speak, Fox explained his not guilty plea as ignorance of certain aspects in the indictment. On the 31st of January 1606, Fox and the three others were dragged from the tower on waddled hurdles to the old palace yard at Westminster, opposite the building they were attempting to destroy. His fellow plotters were then hung and quartered. Fox was the last to stand on the scaffold. He asked for forgiveness of the king and state. Weakened by torture and aided by the hangman, Fox began to climb the ladder to the noose, but either through jumping to his death or climbing too high, so the rope was incorrectly set, he managed to avoid the agony of the later part of his execution by breaking his own neck. His lifeless body was nevertheless quartered, and, as was the custom, his body parts were then distributed to the four corners of the kingdom, to be displayed as a warning to other would-be traitors. On the 5th of November, 1305, Londoners were encouraged to celebrate the king's escape from assassination by lighting bonfires. An act of parliament designated each 5th of November as a day of thanksgiving for the joyful day of deliverance and remaining in force until 1859. In Britain, the 5th of November has variously been called Guy Fawkes Night, Guy Fawkes Day, Plot Night, and Bonfire Night. The later can be traced directly back to the original celebration of the 5th of November in 1605. Bonfires were accompanied by fireworks from the 1650s onwards, and it became a custom to burn an effigy. Effigies were most often made of fox. 